Well, somebody's got to say amen to that. My goodness, that's great. Uh, Glenn, you do a great job, song leading brother. Thanks, uh, thanks for coming back from your he- ill health a couple of weeks ago and doing such a great job for us. Uh, David, good to see you, brother. And my, his words were just perfect this morning. I mean, it's just about that, isn't it? Just stopping and saying, God, you have blessed us in Jesus Christ. That was well worded. I leaned over to Levon and said, man, I like that guy. And, and that's about the only reason, but I do. I like that guy. Great to see you, brother. Um, we have uh, all experienced a new, a new year, a new decade. And uh, I know we're looking forward to the next few years. Hopefully they're not as crazy as this last year was. And uh, I'm praying that God is going to do good things through us through the next um, through the next year, and uh, even for the rest of our lives. I don't know what he's got planned for all of us, but I know that God has a plan ultimately for all of us to be with him eternally. And so I'm excited about that and thrilled about that. One announcement today, I'm looking over here at some of you guys. Uh, in the bulletin, you'll notice that there's a Monday night Bible study for the uh, college and 20s. Uh, so that's going to be not starting tomorrow. That's starting on the 11th. So a week from tomorrow. I just want to get a, get a date with that. Seven o'clock fellowship hall back there. Okay. Let's study a little bit today. Matthew chapter three is where we're going to go. And we're going to read one through 17 of, of, uh, of that chapter. Um, we are at an incredible point in scripture where, where Jesus is coming on the scene as a, as an adult ready to begin his ministry. Uh, now, we've seen him actually in the Old Testament in prophecy pointing forward to Jesus and, and seen all of those rescue stories that, that God wanted to introduce to us to say, now, you, you just hold on, buckle your seatbelts. The ultimate rescue is about to come in the form of Jesus Christ and his ministry and what he's going to do for mankind. And that's what we're going to begin to see today. We've seen him in the Old Testament pointing, pointing to that. We've seen him as a baby. We've seen him as a teenager. And now we see him as about 30. And he's on his way to the Jordan River. Because something really important, something colossal actually, is happening at the Jordan River. You see, there's this guy there. Um, his name is John. We call him John the Baptizer or John the Baptist. And he is dressed in camel hair, and he's been eating a lot of bugs, locusts, and wild honey. And that's not the only reason people from Judea are all flocking out there to see this strange guy. They're also flocking out there because it's been 400 years since God had sent a prophet to tell people what what they needed to do to be uh, pleasing to God. And it's been 400 years, (coughs) excuse me, in the Old Testament, there's this silence right at the end of it, when God stops sending prophets down, in 400 years, people are left to say, well, I'm going to do it my way because that's the way I, I like it. And God knows that. They've rejected him long enough. And so 400 years goes by, and then John shows up on the scene with a message from God. And this message was kind of different also. This is another reason why people were flocking out to the Jordan River. It says from Ju- Jerusalem and Judea and, and all around, they were all coming to the Jordan to listen to John and the message that he was teaching. That's why we have to, to slowly and methodically go through this passage because John is introducing Jesus, the Messiah, and he's also introducing the message of God. He's introducing the man of God, the, the God, and he is God in the flesh, Emmanuel meaning God with us. So John introduces him as the Savior. And then John is also going to introduce the message that Jesus is going to continue to teach. And then after that, the, all the apostles are going to teach it. And then after that, so there are some writers that are going to write it down and And this is the crux of the matter. If we don't get this right, then we're going to be lost eternally. So let me get a clicker out here and and click through this first. I've got my remote 
car opener, so that's not the one to use. But they look so close. Somebody ought to do something about that. Okay, here we go. That was about the man, and that was about the message that John is going to present. Before we go there, we've got to talk about the setup. Now, this is mentioned in every one of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all say this about Isaiah 700 years earlier, who was prophesying about John. Matthew 3, 3. For this is he, talking about John, who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Isaiah was saying, there's a guy going to come and he's going to be the one that introduces Christ, preparing the way for, for Christ to, to begin his ministry. Mark chapter 1, 2 says, behold, I send my messenger before you who will prepare your way. Here's the next one. It is John 1, 23. I am the voice, John says, I am the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness, make, stri- make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. And then one more time. So it, Luke 3, 6 says, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. This is how Isaiah said it's going to begin. This ultimate rescue story is going to be right here when Jesus begins his ministry. So let's read that together. This is uh, Matthew chapter 3, and that is... Um, 1 through 17. It goes something like this. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were coming out to, excuse me, were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. And when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to his baptism, He said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not presume to say to yourself, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid at the root of the tree. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down, thrown in the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for this is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented, and when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. John says, let me tell you, I'm not worthy to even wipe his feet. People were following John. He had a following. He had disciples. John 3.30, John himself says, wait a minute. Jesus must increase and I must decrease. Jesus is the Savior. And he's the one we've all been waiting for. So John introduces him like this. Now, I want to say once again, this is from all four Gospels. And if all four Gospels mention it, we've got to say, we've got to push the pause button and say, wait a minute. The Gospel, the story of Jesus, they want us to know clearly. And especially John. Here are some of his words to introduce. 
Jesus. Jesus was the Son of God who is fully pleasing to God. Matthew 3, 16, we just read that. Jesus was the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. That's what John 1, 29 says. Jesus was joined by the Holy Spirit of God after his baptism. Luke 3 and 22. And then the last one here, I believe there it is. Jesus would provide the Holy Spirit to indwell others. I could go on and on about Jesus Christ. We know him well. Here at the League Street Church of Christ, we love to talk about Jesus. We like to talk about his personality and his miracles and, and, and what his purpose was. Uh, for today, I, I don't want to make that sound less at all, less important, it's not. But I want to go on just past the man Jesus and go to his message. Because John not only introduces Jesus, he introduces his message. The message of Jesus is what we want to see what John has to say. People were being baptized for the forgiveness of sins. We, we read that in Matthew 3, 6. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins. That's Mark chapter 1, verse 4. Luke 3, 3 says, and he went into all the region around Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sin. And then in John 1, 26, and then 33, John was sent by God to baptize with water. For the first time, people heard something that was unique, that was different, that they had not heard before. And this message drew people to that river. The first thing that John says is there's this thing called repentance. Repentance means quite a few things. I've summed it up in three points here. Repentance is when you figure out that you have sinned, you have not lived according to how God intended for you to live. You see, we were all created in the image of God, and we were all given a purpose to glorify God with our lives every single day that we live, and we don't do that. We can't really do that perfectly. We're human, and we're going to sin. Romans 3.23 says, all sin. When you realize that you have sinned, then repentance has got to happen. John says, let's start there. Let's start there with repentance. And he, he really says these three things. First, you've got to realize your direction in life. Are you going towards God or are you going towards things that are not of God? Here's what I've written. See that you are going in the wrong direction with your life and actions and be sorry for those things. Those things are not what God had in mind for you in the first place as his creation. You were made to honor God. God. Repentance means, hey, I, I'm realizing I'm messing this up. That's not the way I, I intended to, to glorify God because it doesn't. I have sinned in my past. That's the first thing, first step. The second is to reverse your direction. See that your life is pursuing the things uh, and ways that God would have you go, drawing you closer to him as you live for him. Three is, is to reveal your new godly life. Let me read that and I'll tell you why. I threw this in there. Let people and God know by your thoughts and your words and your actions that you are going God's way instead of your own. The reason that the Pharisees were brought up in this passage is because they were coming out to John and they were wanting to be baptized by John because everybody was doing it. By the way, that's not a good reason he baptized. But what he brings out is, wait a minute, you Pharisees and you Sadducees, you're not repenting. You're not wanting to change anything. You see, in their religious group, they were a part of the Jewish nation. And the Jewish nation didn't have to repent about anything. They thought, we're God's people. And so he's like, wait a minute, you've got that all wrong. When you realize that even as the Jewish people, you know, God, God could, could raise up from these stones Jewish people. But you need to know that God. That, that God wants you to repent of the sins that you've committed. You, you've lived, you, you've done things, you've said things that don't, don't glorify God. And, 
and it's more than that. It's, it's the realization that you know you can't do it without God. And so you begin to say, I'm going to turn control over to God. And so that repenting has, has got to happen. You know, this is one of the reasons uh, that, that infants, children, are, are not really categorically qualified to be baptized because they can't repent. They don't have the hearts of repentance. An infant, an eight-day-old child, how, first of all, has he sinned? I don't know, but, but I don't think so. But then he surely can't have a heart of repentance. That's why that doesn't work. You don't qualify for that. So, so let's go to the next slide. I want to talk about more than just repentance today. It's only applicable to a repentant heart, this baptism thing. And that's what John brings up next. This is different because let me say, in the Old Testament, there, there, were, a lot, there were a lot of baptisms that went on. And there were a couple of different reasons for that. In fact, around uh, Jerusalem and the Judean area, they have uncovered about 400 different baptismal pits. It's like everybody gets their backyard sauna. I mean, that's kind of the way it was. And they were baptized so that they could participate in Jewish religious things. They would bring their bulls and their goats and their sacrifices and and then they would have ceremonial washings to, to cleanse them. Or if they were not a Jew, they could be baptized to, to say, I, I'm going to be kind of associated with these Jewish people and I have to go through this cleansing process to, to be a Jew. But John, became, he came teaching something totally different. Let's read through these and we'll talk about it. It's only applicable to a repentant heart. Adults and infants who will not or cannot repent are not qualified. Baptism is for forgiveness of sins, not because sins have already been forgiven. I thought about going to the kitchen back here and grabbing a handful of ice and just preaching the whole time with ice in my hand, just as a visual aid. Of course, I, then I realized it would drip all over me. And, but what is ice for? Ice is to cool things down, right? You love to have your glass of tea in the summertime, but you first put ice in it because it's got to cool it down. That's the purpose of ice. In this passage, for forgiveness of sins, John was teaching a baptism of repentance for forgiveness is that's to accomplish that word for it is the word ice you spell it e-i-s but it really is more like i-c-e ice which means to accomplish the cooling of your tea in the scripture this word for is to accomplish forgiveness now let me back that up a little bit. Nobody said, oh, Christ is healing people. I am healed, and so I'm going to go to Christ to be healed. They don't say, I've already been healed, and then they go to Christ. They say, I'm going to go to Christ for healing. And in the same way that baptism was seen, I, I'm not going to go to this baptismal water scene because I have been forgiven of sins. It's for Forgiveness, it's to accomplish forgiveness of sins. I'm not going to go to him and say, yeah, I've already been forgiven of sin, but why don't you go ahead and baptize me? That's crazy. That's wrong. That word for is such a pivotal word, 161 times. And every time, it's to accomplish what follows behind it, for healing, for forgiveness. This is why baptism is being preached for the first time. And it's something that is done one time. You don't have to go back every week or every two weeks or every celebration time and offer another bull or goat or bird or whatever. It's a one-time deal because Christ's death, burial, and resurrection is a one-time deal. So let me keep going. Number three is to identify with Christ. This happens in baptism. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is so important. Every believer joins Christ in the like way. Romans 6, 5 says that if you have been baptized, if you have been Killed and buried and raised like him. Killed, dying to your life of sin. Buried under the water, just like Christ was buried under the ground. And then raised to new life. Then you have joined Christ. You identify with him and what he did on the cross. Next, for entrance into the kingdom of Christ. Remember, he came uh, 
preaching the baptism of repentance for the, for, for the forgiveness of sin because the kingdom is at hand. What John was saying was Christ is here. He's right here. And he's about to come here and start his ministries. You can almost touch him. And then Jesus came to the water. And entrance into the kingdom is all about Jesus Christ and identifying with him in this baptismal scene. And then finally, to allow one to receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Remember that? That's what Jesus was identified as, somebody who would allow the Holy Spirit to go into people. And in fact, the one passage in John says, nobody had the indwelling of the Holy Spirit until after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He made it possible for that same Spirit that swooped down on him, not in the form of a dove, but swooped like a dove, and said, this is my son. And when you are born again, that's when God says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. When you're baptized into Christ, that last passage, uh, Galatians 3.27 says, you've been baptized into Christ and you receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Stop, we're gonna back that up a little bit. Missed the slide there. Okay, so, so let, me, let, me, let me sum this up. It was so important for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to say, let me tell you about Jesus Christ. But let me tell you through the eyes of John. Let me tell you what happened when Jesus began his ministry. John introduced Jesus. And, and, and he said, Jesus is that Savior we've been waiting on. He's the king of the kingdom. Do you want to be a part of his kingdom? And so I ask you that today. Do you want to be a part of Christ's kingdom? If so, then listen to John because he teaches the same thing that Jesus teaches. Mark 16, 16. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. That's what Jesus says, all right? In Acts 2, 38, that's what Peter says. Uh, Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. That's exactly what he taught. And all the apostles in that context of Acts chapter 2 were teaching the same thing. We only have record of Peter standing up and telling all the crowds. But every one of those apostles was telling people in each of their languages the exact same message. What message was that? That was the message that Christ was, was just getting through teaching. He said this in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, go and teach all nations to be baptized. You, you, remember, you remember reading that? That's the same thing, same message that John taught way back here, repent be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. If you understand who Jesus is and the death and burial and resurrection that, that he is going to go through as the one-time sacrifice for you, no more bulls and goats, then you'll say, I want to identify and connect with, be part of that, you're baptized into Christ. And forgiveness of sins is what God does at that moment. Colossians chapter 2, 11, 12, and 13. We're going to read that together. Because here's where a lot of our religious friends miss the boat, sorry to say. Some people say that, yes, repenting is important. Of course, belief in Christ is important. But the baptismal scene is optional. But here's what it says in Colossians chapter 2, 11, 12, and 13. So they'll, they'll say, some will say, it's just a work that we do, and we don't work ourselves to heaven. So if you put it over in that work category, then it's optional because we don't work our ways to heaven. Well, let me tell you, actually, Colossians chapter 2 says it is a work. Hello, wake up, everybody. It is a work. But look who's doing the work. This is Colossians chapter 2. Let's start at verse 9. Let's go at 8. I get a little excited about this passage. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy or empty deceit according to human tradition. If you believe something other than what Jesus taught and what John taught and what Peter taught about repenting, being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, you are being misled. You are listening to human tradition. That's what he's talking about. Don't do that. See to that no one takes you captive by philosophy or empty deceit according to the human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him... The whole fullness of deity, 
wait a minute, if that's, that's God, the Spirit in Christ, in Him the whole fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and you have been filled in Him who is the head of all rule and authority. In Him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ. Wait a minute. At this scene in John's story of introducing the man, Jesus, in the message, he said, because of your belief in Christ, you can have your sins cut away from you. Remember in the Old Testament, it started back in Genesis chapter 18, when, when through Abraham said, hey, listen, circumcise your, your children so that they'll be a part of this family. And then here, Christ is doing the work of circumcision. He's cutting away the sin from your hearts. Jesus is doing the work, but we're not through yet. Keep reading. Verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism. By the way, when is all this taking place? During your burial in baptism. Christ is cutting away your sins at that point having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Stop the truck. Who's working in this passage? It's not us. It's not any believer. We're just saying, somebody do something to me. Kill me, plunge me under, pull me back up. Not after three days, but after three seconds, perhaps. But Christ did it for three days. Please, let me identify with him. And who's doing the work? Christ, at the point of baptism, is cutting away the sins. And at the point of baptism, God is doing the rest of the work by bringing you back to life. A new person. Free from sin. And then we inherit the kingdom, like David talked about earlier. Because we are sons and daughters of God himself. What a powerful message. And Peter went on to say, it's for everybody. It's for everybody. If you'll just believe in Jesus Christ, that's your first step. If you'll just say, I understand about the death and burial and resurrection of Christ, how he's the sacrifice for my sins. If you repent and say, listen, I messed it up. Now, it's a one-time repentance. No. At that point, you, you must repent or else you're even not qualified. But it's a life of repentance. When you messed it up yesterday and you come to God and say, listen, I, I, I messed it up. And I'm fessing it up. I have sinned. First John says, the blood of Christ will continually cleanse you of sin. And then you're baptized into Christ. And that initial connection with Christ where he cuts away the sin, circumcises your heart, and then God raises you to life. How do we miss that? And as we continue on with the rescue story, we have to look back at the Old Testament. In almost every story that we studied with you this past year about the God that rescues, what was contingent was obedience. If you were going to be rescued, you had to obey every single time. Rahab had to obey. Put the red cord out the window. We know how to find you. Noah had to obey. He had to build the ark. I mean, just go through the list. Everyone calls for obedience. And that's all Jesus is doing. That's all John is doing. They're saying, just obey and let God do the work. And you will know salvation. That's the ultimate rescue story. Man, God made it easy. And then he makes life after that incredible. Pray with me, church. Our Holy Father, thank you for introducing us to Christ in this way. Through the words of Jesus, 
also through the words of John, we know how to be saved. We know how to be forgiven of sins. We know how to be added to the kingdom of Christ that is eternal. Thank you, Father. Thank you for such a clear picture. And we know, Father, that if we teach anything else, but we don't get this right, we'll be lost. Thank you for sending Christ as a sacrifice for our sins. Thank you for sending the message that we can be free from sin and to rise up to a brand new life. And then, Father, help us to bring forth fruit of repentance, to to have changed lives after being born again so that you will be displayed clearly to those in our circles here at home and to those we contact throughout our lives. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Father, for the plan of salvation. Through Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. God bless you for being here today. I'm looking forward to the time when we're all together. The early service, we had a great crew, and it's a great way to start out the new year. I pray that as we start out this new year together, we will keep in mind what God has done through Jesus Christ for us and celebrate that with our lives every day. Let's stand, sing a song together, church.